support, Indeed. kindness, you know, um, yeah. general respect, reciprocity, uh, learning based behaviors and dispositions. Yeah. Yet at a competitive level, you'd be saying there's something qualitatively different about Definitely. the nature of the reward. Would you mind just kind of emphasizing what would be different at the more competitive level? Uh, well, I'll just take a specific example. I coach probably one of the country's best six-year-olds. Now, I've coached him since he was five. My talks to him are not like an ordinary talk to a six-year-old. I, I have a form of words with him when he's doing something wrong. I just simply say, David, he knows what's coming. It's some negativity. So for the first time, I slip negative reactions in. Be careful of the judgment, good job, when you actually you doubt it is a good job. Yes, because they will go home and they will say, ah, today my teacher said I did a good job in chess. Thank you. And this is not fair. I mean, it's not true. It's not. And then after a couple of months, uh, the father will ask me why my kid is not improving. You said he was doing a good job. <laughs> it's not like that, you know. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Can we take one more, one more reflection? Thank you so much. And uh, we'll ask two then in that case. Thank you. So, um, just from recent examples, I think the challenges that you face in the club and the CSC class situation are very different. We do have, um, for instance, one of the first things you, when you when you walk in, you introduce to a class of 30 children. Um, it's kind of not just the fact that they're whether they are eager to learn, because that's very very disparate amongst the whole sort of, you know, a lot of 30 children, but behavior, making sure that the concentration, they stick to certain rules. So I tend to emphasize my five golden rules of chess, courtesy, happiness, enthusiasm, sportsmanship, silence, and again and again, I use that in both club and school situation. In my club situation, I give a cumulative award towards the end, the five golden rules award towards the end of a term or a year if I have observed that children are respecting those rules as they go along. This is Norman Vincent Peale, who made that observation many decades ago. Most of us would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. I'm going to invite us to take a, a little trip down the research line and have a look at uh, what the meta-study reviews do suggest about praise. One of many things, or over 200, different influences on student learning that John Hattie at the University of Melbourne in an ongoing uh, synthesis of meta-studies has found uh, about a quarter of a trillion students in total in all the studies. So this is a massive study and he's looking at what are the most positive and powerful influences on student achievement. One of the things he studied is praise and he's found that it does do three things. When you kind of hoover up all the research evidence, he's found that it can make people happier. <coughs> now this is what you're evidencing in, you know, notions of uh, supporting kids to feel okay in a situation. I feel happy in the situation. Uh, I really like that observation, Davina. Thank you. That's a very insight. What I'm doing is I'm praising Davina. It might make her happy. But here's the risk. Look at the qualifiers. Some people in some situations at some times. When I've said to Davina, that's a wonderful observation. Thank you, Davina. That's, that's really impressive. She might feel happy or she might feel patronized or she might feel I'm manipulating her. Can you see the possible different interpretations that I'm giving Davina over here? I would hope through my intention to make her happy, but depending on a whole variety of factors, the rapport I've got with you, the nature of the environment, whether I had a breakfast, my blood sugar levels, she could be taking it in a very, very different way. <coughs> we just need to be in a relationship to know the truth of that. I mean, I had some things. You could praise a pupil to um, stop messing with his pieces in a chess lesson. Can I compliment you? You know, Nathan, you're, you're sitting very really still and listening very carefully. And you might even keep him doing that in the whole chess session. So you can actually moderate a child's behavior through praise. Proximal praise does that in a whole bundle of other ways. But please note there are also qualifiers here. Some people in some situations at some times. No guarantees. Now the devastating finding from the research is there is no number four. Not what we found yet. I'd love to say that number four is it helps us learn. And there's no evidence it does. In fact, uh, John Hattie is quite clear. He describes it as a fallacy, one of two educational fallacies, that people learn more when they get praised. He says there's no evidence they learn more. It might make them happy, 
might get them to do things, might get them keeping doing things, but there's no evidence that they learn more. And in fact, um, you know, it's a fallacy that we should need that kind of praise to feel okay about ourselves. It's not saying this doesn't happen. I need praise sometimes. But when I reflect on when I need praise the most, to be honest, it's when I'm most insecure. I'm needing you to tell me, Rita, tell me this is going okay. You know? and so that's when I'm going to be seeking out and soliciting the praise. Young infancy, right through to adulthood, and they found there's no significant difference in terms of the age. Because one of the arguments I would make quite intuitively is surely little kids need a lot of praise, and over time we wean them off it. And they should be standing on their own feet a little bit more. And the really interesting thing is they haven't found those differences. Not saying they don't exist. You know, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Culture independent. Culture? Culture? There are a few cultural differences. I mean, we can look to some countries, for instance, in the Far East, where praise is used far more sparingly than it does in countries like America. Yeah. We're talking to our colleague yesterday. He says, unless a kid at a tournament walks away with a trophy bigger than himself, he will be devastated, or she. You know, I need a trophy at least my size to feel okay about myself. But in other cultures, you think, you know, well, what's going on here? This is, this is kind of strange. Well, what I'd like to offer is a definition of praise, just so we are kind of, you know, singing from the same um, hymn sheet at the moment. This is a definition from the uh, dictionary, the Merriam-Webster dictionary. It's an American dictionary, which is why spelling's all wrong. Uh, but uh, my, little, my little judgment being made over there. It's very similar to most dictionary definitions. Number one is the definition that we're using as chess tutors. Number two is a specific, uh, if you like, faith-based definition. But number one, to express a favorable judgment. Now the key word over here is that word judgment. It's a positive judgment, it's not a negative judgment, but it's still a judgment. Now what we know from research of people like Carol Dweck, uh, the Hattie Reviews, is that one of the first things we should avoid as tutors is setting myself up as a judge. It's the kind of the golden rule of, um, of good teaching and tuition. Don't judge. Because the moment I set myself up as a judge, I'm taking away from the child that sense of personal responsibility for my learning. I'm looking to you to tell me is this right or wrong. I don't need to know. You just tell me. And then I know whether or not to go forward. And this is a role that we as teachers can very easily slip into. And I know I, I'm speaking from personal experience, not just kind of from the moral high ground over here. It's very easy to move into a desirable role of me giving positive judgment-based praise. You're clever. You're a genius. You're a, you're a future grandmaster. Now what I'm doing there is I'm orienting that student towards getting that favorable judgment in the future. The judgment. Not necessarily the performance, the learning, the engagement in risks, the failure on which all learning depends, making mistakes. Nobody has become a grandmaster without losing, I forget what the figure was, a huge number of games. Lose your first 10,000 games quickly. Lose your first 10,000 games quickly. Resign on move two. Submit to scholars mates in move four every game. But not quite that, isn't it? It's kind of play your best. But, but, but play a lot and get those out of the way. It's, it, it's interesting, that 10,000, because it comes to the Ericsson 10,000 yeah, hour and, yeah. and, and things like that of, of mastery. But if I'm orienting my students towards getting my favorable judgment, I'm probably going to be doing that with that kind of judgment-based praise, kind of clever girl, good boy, the kind of thing that lots of parents in the UK and America and other Western countries do do a lot. Clever girl, good boy, so smart. Now what we're doing over here is invoking judgment. And I've just uh, made a little tweet to something I use with teachers quite a lot, colleagues, and I'd, I'd like to see you know, how this relates to you. I'm gonna give you five pieces of chess-related praise. I'm gonna invite you just to reflect on, is there a subtext which is unhelpful? For this one, you're a really good player, I'm so proud of you. Could I ask you just with somebody next to you, um, are there any risks? The intentions, I'm sure, are fine. But are there any risks for the child who's in receipt of that praise? Would you mind just taking a minute with somebody sitting next to you? It's about performance, it's not about learning. Now that was never the intention of the person who, who made that judgment. And you can see there's a very explicit judgment. You are a good player. 
Well, David is a good player, one of the best six-year-olds in the country, but he's not yet a grandmaster. So we then have to decide what do we mean by good, good for your age, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole context. lot of discussion to be had within the, within the contextual explanation. It's a positive judgment, but there is a risk. And there are too many children, I suspect, that all of us will have worked with, who think that their value to their parents is actually based on their success in the tournament. I will, I, will, I will lead to disappointed parents or coaches if I don't do well. It's all about the success. Judgment number two. Wow, you won that game so quickly. You've got a mind like stockfish. <laughs> Other engines are available. <laughs> but what is the risk for no number three? Kareem, you've won again. I can always rely on you to produce the goods. Because I could ask just immediately, what's your immediate reservation about that piece of praise for Kareem? Any take? Expectation. High expectation. So what Kareem is learning is that um, I, I'm only going to play weaker opponents. I'm not going to go up to the next level and play in the under 160s because, you know, this is my comfort ground, the under 140s. Because if I start losing against stronger players, then I'm going to be devastated. Now that was never the intention of that judgment. But here again is the critical thing. It doesn't matter what our intention was. All that matters is what's the potential impact. How is it being heard by the person receiving that feedback? In this case, in the form of praise. But my biggest uh, curveball, colleagues, is number four. I like the way you won that piece. It's really creative. Now, would I be wrong in suggesting that number four doesn't look as bad as the one that we've just explored? Yeah. That looks so much right. doesn't it? Yeah. What's wrong with number four, if anything? Not specific. It's not specific. So, the child might not know or remember the particular technique that he used to win that piece. So, not specific. Is there anything else? It's, it's still judgmental to say it's creative. That's still a judgment, though, isn't it? It's big judgment. Which is why it's still praise. You <coughs> might not have won it, and the other person might have lost it. Okay, it thank you. Fortune and creativity that might never be replicable. It thank might not you. Be based on a piece of technique. Thank you. Respect our approval, and and we do it through loving intent to make them feel confident. But what do we know from the studies? Confidence is not what it's about, and I'll extend that to chess confidence. I would argue, colleagues, that the evidence that I've read suggests that we should not, as chess students, be aiming to make young people feel confident in their chess ability. What that leads to is vulnerability in the face of failure. Because that confidence turns out to be wafer thin. Our job as teachers, as chess tutors, as parents, is actually to create resilience in young people. And resilience trumps confidence. This is still judgment. Um, what I would suggest would be different would be Hey, I noticed that you found a really unusual way of winning that piece. How did you do that? L let's have a conversation about it. But that's when we're moving to Carl's feedback. Because when I notice, there's no judgment. But when it's nice and I like it, the judgment is there. Now, this might look like a very subtle, fine distinction. But, but personally, I think it's a crucial one in distinguishing between praise and feedback. When a teacher says, I like the way you've done this, the implication is, this is the right way, someone I admire, I like this person, so I surely will want to do things, as Rita says, to impress her. This is what we do with our parents, this is what we do with our teachers, anyone we value, we want to please. And I do think there is a kind of a human understanding there, but it's built on the notion of the support and the praise and the recognition that I've received. But when it's not I like, but I notice, we have stripped the judgment from the comment, and we've moved into the world of feedback. You've got alongside that child, you've shown interest in what he's done. He knows you've noticed very carefully something that's happened, and children thrive on the right kind of adult attention. Especially when it's insightful, it's accurate, uh, it's, it's, it's relevant to what the child has been intending to do, and you've got alongside them over there. It is, if you like, a way of moving from this towards what people like Carol Dweck and others would describe as wise praise. I personally now introduce an R, because I don't think it's the wisest, but it is getting better. And she would say, um, at least make sure that it's the effort, not the ability. Well, you could argue 
that I like the way you've tried hard in this game and you've stuck at it, you didn't resign too soon. All of that is about the effort and ability, which makes it better than, you know, you're, you're a good chess player, uh, this is a, a really nice game which, you know, meets a, a few other problems. Uh, but I would argue that it would be even more powerful to get away from the praise. And I noticed that you didn't resign early. Uh, and, and, and what is the effect? Well, actually, I got a draw out of it, didn't I? So what you've done is you've given that job over to your student. It wasn't about the judgment. You're being more specific. And this is the point that Rita made in one of her earlier concerns, well, I like the way you, etc. It wasn't very specific. There's plenty of evidence that specific <coughs> praise is more powerful than general praise. Nice game. In what way? What, 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 what was nice about it? And, and do I really need your judgment? But show me an interest. You know, at, at what point here were you, were you, uh, you know, struck by something that I've done? There's plenty of evidence that private praise can be more powerful than public praise. Yet in schools, in the UK, many primary schools have what is called praise assembly. Praise assembly, and it's a public recognition. Now, even in young years, I know many children who do not like public praise. But to say to the child at the end of the game, can I have a quick word to you, Ronaldo? And, uh, and you say, Ronaldo, I noticed that, etc., um, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, et cetera. And, and I appreciate that, I recognize that. That can be far more powerful than Ronaldo winning the trophy twice his size before an audience of 300 people. I mean, this one is too obvious even to mention sometimes. Be genuine. There's no point in saying, uh, as, 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 as you identified earlier, good job if it wasn't a good job. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting, when we come to grading, it, you could argue that ratings, gradings are, in a sense, extrinsic motivators. And titles. And titles. Of course, they are very public extrinsic motivators, and you would hope that most children who get to love chess would want to progress. But it's really helpful if we see those as the happy accidents of a love of the game. It's the secondary gift. There are too many young children who are terrified of losing rating points, in my experience. So they will not take on tough opponents, they will, you know, um, um, spend too much time obsessing about the opening when actually they should be understanding their uh, understanding of the middle game or the end, except it's all about rating points. And those are the children I suspect who will end up not having as high a grading as those who enter into challenges, accept difficult situations, learn from them, go back, review and reflect. The rating looks after itself. Most of my work is with teachers. I would say let the results, let the academic results look after themselves. Make your focus on the process, the joy, the intrinsic satisfaction of the learning experience. Get them to love your subject as much as you do. Those are the kids who go away, do more work, extra reading, come back, and do you know what? No surprise, they do not suffer when it comes to academic results. The, the rule is basically put learning before performance because it doesn't reverse engineer. When kids love learning, performance happens. But when you put the focus on performance, am I going to hit this grade, am I going to get this result, am I going to get this title, the casualty <coughs> is very often the performance. I had a lovely observation, I forget who said it in one of our discussions yesterday, he said that when Susan Polgar was asked, you know, um, what reward should you give in chess? Her answer was, chess is the reward. In other words, what she's suggesting, it is intrinsically such an interesting game. Put the focus on squeezing the interest from that. But I'm very aware when talking with teachers that they say to me, Barry, this is a tough message. We are held accountable from the grades. I'm saying that's why we should get kids loving learning rather than fearful of not reaching the grade. Because there are way too many kids who, if they think they're not going to meet the grade, which has got high status, such high status, they opt out of the learning situation. They become underachievers with lots of peer credibility. They subvert class clowns. They give up chess because they're fearful they're not going to get someone else's expectation. Please don't get me wrong. Please don't get me wrong. They can be motivated. They can be motivated. I, I would suggest that most children are motivated by extrinsic motivators like performance. My only observation would be this. It would be the longer term effect of that motivation. And that longer term effect is on intrinsic motivation. So for the child who is obsessed, and I know many kids and adults who are obsessed about their performance and will work to get the performance, and they may reach the performance, but the longer term cost 
is to the intrinsic motivation. I'll give you just kind of one classic study for this. It's, it was conducted at Stanford University in 1971. Mark Lepper and his colleagues Green and Nisbet. Um, this wasn't the first time, but it was the first time it was done with very little children. And what they were using was notions of uh, intrinsic interest in art. And they found loads of kids in kindergartens in the Bay Region of San Francisco who loved art. And they put them into three uh, groups. The three groups were uh, randomly distributed. The only condition was, on average, each group showed an equal amount of interest in art, as defined by how much time they did art in free play art situations. So 15 minutes before lunchtime, the teacher says, now you can do whatever you like. And these kids always went to do art. Their friends went to do other things, big play, sand, water, etc. They always went to do art. In other words, they were intrinsically interested to do art. Now what they then did was they put these children into one of three conditions. The first group were told at the start of the session, if you do art, you can replace this with chess. If you do chess, now that you can do whatever you want, you could do board games, Monopoly, you go, but if you do chess, I'm going to give you a certificate when you've done the chess. And that's what happened. The children did their chess, it was actually art, they got their certificate. The second group were not told at the start of the free play. They were simply invited to do whatever they wanted to do, but they went to do art, we could say chess, because they like chess, they're interested in it. And when they had done the chess, at the end of the session, they were given a certificate. So the first group was expecting a certificate, if you do chess you will get it. The second group, not told, but now that you've done it, now that you've done it, here's your certificate. And the third group were just the control, they, they weren't told and they didn't get the certificate. They then stopped giving the certificates to the two groups who had been getting them. And they found that only one group suffered. No group benefited. The group that suffered was the group expecting a certificate. What went through their minds was, I, I was doing art or chess because I love it. And then someone said, if I do art or chess, I will give you something. Why would they do that? Well, it must be because actually chess isn't all that much fun. You get me? They've got to give me something to get me to do it. Well, I'm not a fool. If they're not going to give me a certificate anymore, I'm not going to go anywhere near that chess board until they start giving me certificates again. It killed the intrinsic motivation. The second group, it didn't have that effect. Now that you've done chess, here's a certificate. What went through their minds was, I've always liked doing chess, art. And then when I did my chess, they gave me something. Why would they do that? Well, I've got no idea, but if it makes them happy, I'll take it. And, uh, no skin off my nose. And the third group, no change. So the way when this was published, the study, which has become a classic psychological study, was it didn't say rewards don't work. Children do work for rewards and performance grades and the others, or many children do. But the study title was simply the hidden costs of rewards. And the hidden costs are to the child's intrinsic motivation. The realistic is to believe we can't have some metrics yeah. at the end you know, for a whole range of reasons. Uh, what I prefer to, the message I have for schools is, you know, don't campaign against GCSEs and A-levels. You know, we're going to need some form of metric, but make sure that those are just what happens at the end of your education experience. And be as prepared as you can for them, and not as worried about them. Yeah, and that's where the mental health problems come from. Performativity, and what if I don't get this? And, you know, my, it's, my, mental it's a mental strain. My, let those metrics be around their learning, not their performance. Here's the general principle. What the school are likely to have heard is that when you've studied this, if you give grades, if you don't give grades but you give really good formative feedback, or if you give grades and feedback, the best results are no grades but really good formative feedback. Now where that school, I don't want to make any judgments, may be slipping up in your daughter's eyes, is she's not getting any specific advice about how to improve. And she's not getting her grades. What she has relied on is the grades to let her know how am I doing. But those are normative bits of information. They are normative metrics. They're normative relative to her peers, you know, the national agenda, etc. The really high quality feedback is not normative, it's around the curriculum. This is what the expectations are, this is what you're achieving, this is what you aren't, this is where you might need to achieve, particularly when that becomes a dialogue. So there may well be a conversation her teachers need to have about how can we give explicit feedback to your daughter so she knows what to do. And it's exactly the same in chess. I don't need to know that the person next to me has got a higher grade than me and I'm, I'm better than that person's grade. What they do need to know is, you know, there's a relative weakness in your positional understanding in this kind of little game. So let's, let's have a little work on this.
Th does that make sense? I mean, he he here is the really tricky bit. If you give the grades and the formative feedback, what we find in school is that children ignore the feedback and focus on the grades. Because it's so easy to, apparently easy to understand, but it doesn't give information about how to do better. When I'm in engaging in, in a generally critical question, and someone can say, I've read around this and I've got a slightly oblique angle on this, this is what we should be aiming. I, I do realize there's a potential this might seem like college to be drifting away from chess tuition, but it's absolutely the same domain. It's absolutely the same domain. If it's the behavior and these things rather than these things with children at every stage, where I would agree coming right back to where we started is Nick's early points, is coming in with a class of 30, we are more likely to move into behavioral <coughs> modification and learning disposition for all the reasons you've articulated so well. But if we were a purist, right from the beginning, we would still be coming in with what is the least external reward I need to give in order to get kids to love this. In other words, put my energies in making this, you know, all these small games, all these variants, all so fascinating that behavior problems do not exist. Now, I know this is counsel of perfection. We rely on the kind of the, the control strategies very often, but sometimes it's because we haven't always yet managed to engage students at that level. And if I could, I don't want to leave this out before we finish at 12.30. This notion of feedback is very, very different from notions of praise. Feedback does not involve judgment. I'll give you just one little example. Mark Lepper who conducted that Stanford study I spoke about earlier, said, our best tutors do not help very much. Colleagues, my time is up. Can I simply say there are a whole bunch of other slides. I do talk uh, about what the research does say about the nature of good feedback, and uh, I haven't got time to go through some of these effects uh, now, but can I just say, uh, we have got hard copies. Uh, please help yourself if you'd like to explore that. Uh, we also have hard copies of my very brief presentation on Mindset yesterday. If you'd like one, please help yourself. We'd be very happy to take initial questions. But thank you. Have a good lunch.